All right, it has been a while, but today's point of discussion is the um, code sort of breakdown and overview of the recent paper, Reinforcement Learning for Quantum Variational Circuit Optimization, um, which I, I wrote as the solo author and um, it was sponsored or supported, I guess, by the Unitary Fund. Um, so I'll, I'll put that below so you can check that out too. But basically what I'm just going to be doing is, uh, as usual, going over to code, sort of understanding what's going on here. There's a lot of code involved. I'm not going to go over all of it, but sort of a representative sample of it. Um, so basically... Uh, just to give an, an overview, and, and I'll, you know, share the paper as well. But um, we all know that quantum variational circuits are difficult to optimize, and so the basic idea is that if you have some circuit, you know, here, your little circuit, um, and you have some gates with parameters that you want to optimize for some arbitrary cost function, so this incorporates any sort of quantum optimization routines such as VQE or QAOA or any sort of hybrid computational system such as variational quantum classifiers or anything like that. Um, you want these parameters, right? So you read out, so you have some cost function that then goes into optimizer, which then goes into right in this loop. And the idea is, is simple, right? We just uh, replace this or in, the, in this case, augment this with some reinforcement learning based agent, right? There's a clear sort of environment interaction setup going on here that, that seems to lend itself to reinforcement learning. And this has been done before, um, it, but it's usually been limited to sort of just a certain circuit structure optimization routine, for example, just QAOA or something like that. Um, and what this is trying to do is sort of expand that out to a more general framework. So um, the idea basically is we train this agent. So this RL agent um, sees, you know, this, this circuit and then gets the cost function and tries to minimize this cost. And it does this just on random circuits. And then in deployment, right, we go over to deployment this cost goes into, you know, your gradient descent optimizer in addition to this RL agent and greedily chooses the, the optimization from there um, to actually, in, in this deployment scenario, whereas training the RL agent is done entirely solo. And so this is what I call augmenting, and this is just solo training, right? So uh, that's for the general overview. It's pretty simple conceptually, especially if you know, you know what RL is. I'm not going to go over all of that. Um, and so uh, just getting into the code, if I switch over, uh, there we go. I should zoom in. So this is pretty much the only environment necessary to train the reinforcement learning agent and it's based on TensorFlow Quantum. Um, unfortunately, or just interestingly, I guess, the, the RL agents are all done in stable baselines three, which is written entirely in PyTorch. So this code has dependencies both on TensorFlow, I believe 2.4 is the, the version TFQ uses, and PyTorch, I don't know, 1.8 or something. So that, that's a suboptimal requiring dependencies on both of them. However, that's only true for training. For deployment, you can just use PyTorch. There's no need to use TensorFlow. So basically, what we have here is we instantiate this environment. Uh, we have some qubits, some depth, some maximum, right? The only constraints on our setup is how many um, qubits we have maximally, how much depth we have maximally, how many steps we have maximally, and how we feed the state right to the RL agent. It can't just look at some quantum circuit and understand it perfectly. We have to actually um, 
render that or, or represent that in, in a compatible way. And so I'll get to that later. And, and for all of these sort of details, um, I, rec I, I recommend you check out the paper. I'm sort of just giving a high level over here view here, and then just really getting into the you know nitty gritty of the code. Um, for a more detailed sort of theoretical understanding, you know, definitely check out the paper. It's pretty short. It's actually, you know, not very long at all. Um, I try to make it as short as possible, as quickly readable as possible, just hitting the highlights. Um, so, yeah, we can just get into it. So basically, there's the max qubits, the max depth. The maximum number of symbols is clearly just the max depth times the max qubits, because in this case, we consider depth one to be a single um, set of gates on each qubit. We create the symbols and then we we have some cost functions, right, that in training we're going to randomly sample from. And so these are, I'll just go to them first, this sort of VQE inspired cost, which is a product of the Z basis um, measurements on each qubit. And then we also create a target value. Um, which is just a random, randomly assigned, right, to say we're trying to minimize this to some point, so we're going to create a target value to minimize 2. Um, and then this one just measures, this is sort of for like some classification you might see in variational quantum classifiers. Um, we just read out the first qubit, and then there's also a sum cost. I don't, I don't know what this is inspired by. This is just something I picked out um, that is just a sum of the Z readout expectation values, and I and this also enables it to have a bigger sort of range on the desired cost, and then we um, create the random circuit, which I'll get into in a sec. Um, we define the action space, which depends on nothing, or only on our maximum symbols. Right, the output of the RL agent is simply the. Um, the symbols or the, the, the weights or parameters or whatever you want to call them for the circuit and it, it put outputs for the maximum circuit size. We can deploy this on smaller circuits because in the input and the, the RL agent sees how big the circuit is and, and then we can just cut or, or you know take the first X values from this array. And then the um, the size of the encoding depends on what type of encoding we have, and I'll get to that once we've reached that point. So first we create a random circuit. So we randomly pick an, a number of qubits between two and however our max is. In the case of this work, it's 20 qubits, 20 depth, and 150 optimization parameters are the models I provide, which is a max of 400 parameters, which is pretty big. Um, the depth is randomly chosen, and then for every depth, we create a circularly entangled set using C knots. Um, we then go through each qubit and create and pick a random gate, RZ, RY, or RX, um, which has the appropriate or associated um, value in the structure, right? When we think about the structure of the circuit, our Z's are associated with two, our Y's are associated with one, our X's are associated with zero. Um, we keep track of just a bunch of these, these parameters. This is just keeping track of things. We pick a random cost function, then we create our, our model, right? This is just how we internally represent this. Um, we use a hundred, or we use a thousand repetitions to estimate the expectation value. Um, and then we pick an input type, right? We can either have the zero ground state input or we could have the equal superposition input, which would just be a Hadamard gate on every qubit. And then so that's basically just how we randomly create the circuit. Pretty intuitive and straightforward. Um, to uh, get the, the each step, right, of the optimization procedure for each step of the environment interaction for the reinforcement learning agent is um, pretty simple. We take the action, which is just the parameters that the RL agent predicts for the quantum circuit. Um, we cut off as, if it's the maximum number of steps. We, we set those parameters to be the weights of the parametrized quantum circuit. We get the error. Um, if it's a small enough error, we can be done. If not, then we increment the steps and return 
return the error as the loss or the negative error <clears throat> as the loss and then we um, continue again and so by error I all I use is right the mean squared error right here the negative of that is a reward function so um, minimizing you know a reward is the same or minimizing cost function is the same as maximizing the negative of it which is you know exactly what we want to do um, in the case of you know some sort of supervised learning process and reinforcement learning is always thought of as maximizing rewards which is why this is framed as a maximization problem okay now we get into the encoding technique so there's two sort of ideas we have um, you can see where they're taken from oh this is actually i should call this block. um so there's feature encoding and block encoding basically feature encoding is designed for your standard dense slash multi-layer perceptron neural network block encoding is designed for your sort of cnn style um, and so feature encoding, basically, you create a, uh, an array that has the number of parameters as rows, and in each you know, row, you have information about that parameter, the current error, the current weight of that parameter, what type of gate that is, where in the circuit is located, and what the circuit structure looks like. And then you flatten that 2D array to be a 1D you know, vector to input. And then um, that's that's just the state for the um, block encoding. The idea is the same thing, just instead of having um, this information be represented in a um, numerical sort of information in a vector, it's represented as a 3D um, NumPy array where implicit in that structure is the depth and the number of qubits. Those are sort of the two dimensions of it. And then at each position, you can think about, right, the first, so zero, zero, right? Or that, like, if you're thinking about it, like, going down, all of those have a certain, like, um, you know, index zero, zero has depth five in this case, if you're sort of visualizing that array. Um, and so each one of those has information, so the qubit number, the depth number, which is sort of... Um, just used, right? You don't you don't actually input that. That's just how it's indexed. So that rather than explicitly giving that information to the neural network, is sort of implicit in the design of the input. And then we um, also feed in the input, the error, and the current weight. So the same information is given to the neural network. It's just in a sort of different format. And so there's, those are the two um, encodings. It's just transposed to make it. Uh, channels first, which is compatible with the way I wrote, or <laughs> the way the CNN is written, which I just took from stable baselines. I shouldn't say I wrote that. Um, the reset function is standard. Um, this is just unimportant. So basically, you can see it's pretty simple, right? It's just over a hundred lines um, to generate this this uh, training process. Now, to actually train it is really simple. Um, we just import stable baselines and. Um, in the, in the paper and in all the optimization work that's done, um, soft actor critic is used, but I evaluated with both TD3 and PPO, so there's sort of that code exists in here. Um, so you can uh, just run this code, right? Um, for this is the only one that matters, right? It creates a neural network with a, you know, these hidden layers of size 1028, 512, and the output of 400 or what, you know, whatever the maximum is. We create the multi-layer perceptron policy. We have these, you know, um, this, this data here, and then we just train it. And so there's not a lot going on here, right? This is all under the hood and stable baselines that it's being handled by. And so with the convolutional neural network training, It's very similar. Um, I just copied this code from the example in Stable Baselines 3. Um, we just use convolutional operations and then we do the um, multi-layer perceptron. We create this exactly the same except we just specify CNN policy. Um, 
But other than that, you know, we train it the same exact way. We do checkpointing because I didn't train it for, you know, some ridiculous number of steps. I just canceled it after like, I don't know, 150 hours or something. Now, that's also why I'm not going to run this code because I don't want to fry my, my laptop. This was all run on RTX, I don't know, A6000, R6000, I don't know what the GPU is called, using the online service Lambda Labs. Um, and so I can mix out of both of those and that. And now this is just some examples of how we evaluated it. Um, I don't need to go through all of them. All of this code actually is already code I just copied from previous work I'd done. So this, you can find this exact code for each model and the uh, associated videos I've already made. Um, so I'm not going to go through the code. I'm just going to say, you know, we create it, we evaluate it and, and, you know, see how each one independently performs. And then we do this comparison, right? We take the best, we greedily select from these um, choices to um, create this augmented evaluation. which is um, which is how it's sort of meant to be used because it's um, you know such a complex problem that when we remove all of the, com the the constraints on it there's no I mean it's hard for RL to succeed so we sort of have to use it sort of as an augmenting rather than by itself so that's just what it looks like we can see QAOA is the same sort of style right um, you, I evaluated both with adjoint and parameter shift differentiation. I'll show the uh, the results maybe in just a second. Um, so all of this is already there. What I just want to get to, I mean, I can go through them, but they're all basically the same, right? We just create each you know model. We optimize using you know we just predict what the RL agent says. And then we set the weights, we go through and we optimize. What I just want to show is briefly that it's basically the same for the noisy functions. We just have a, um, somewhere in here, uh, here we go. We just add some depolarizing noise to the circuit. Um, this is actually a pretty high amount of noise, so I'm not sure you know what the exact depolarizing noise is in you know, real circuits, but it's pretty high, which is probably you know similar to near-term quantum devices. Worth noting here is that this you can see the loss functions in every case is not the training is sort of out of distribution or out of you know what our training setup was. This is sparse categorical cross entropy, which we did not train the RL agent on, but it still works because it's sort of just trying to minimize this the difference between the target cost and, and this and this the self. And so you can sort of think of the way I understand the RL agent is acting as sort of like an annealing process, right? Um, it jumps around because it doesn't know a lot about the, the circuit. It just knows its structure. But right, if it's trying to minimize this sparse categorical cross entropy, which it hasn't seen before, then you know, it's going to take a step in a direction, realize it's bad, go the opposite way and sort of figure its way out. So it's not really, I don't like to think of it as, as, as smooth as a, um, gradient sort of optimizer where it's always taking a step in the right direction. It takes lots of steps in right and wrong directions before sort of trying to find the goal, right? It was trained to do is the, the optimal policy in this case would be to find a global optimum on step one, which would be, well, not even a global optimum, but the perfect solution, which may or may not even exist, to be honest, for the given circuit, right? That the global optimum might not even be good enough, but the, the optimal policy would be to find a global optimum on step one. So it's sort of, um, that's sort of like how, how I think about it is, is this annealing process rather than a gradient optimization procedure. Um, and so that's basically all the training. If you want to deploy it, I have these models saved online. I'll just go over that real quick. Um, we can see that this uh, function is all you need. You don't have to worry about any of the code I just presented. You just need stable baselines three, which requires PyTorch. Um, and then you need to feed it your function, which takes as um, input the weights and is able to return a loss um, function. That's all you need. And then 
uh, just input the structure. The structure, by the way, is um, sort of qubit oriented. So if your circuit is like Rx, or I'll just do it this way, Rx, right? This is the qubit Rx, Ry, Rx, Ry. This would not be, the structure would not be 0, 1, 0, 1, right? If you're going, this is 0, this is 1, this is 0, this is 1, it would be um, 0, 0, 1, 1. So just keep that in mind if you use it. Um, the number of qubits is obvious, the current parameters is obvious, the current loss, all of this is pretty clear. It's just the structure that I wanted to go over. And so that's all you need to do to use this if you want to use it to optimize your circuit. I'll probably create some examples in the future. Now, let me just um, bring up the, uh, where is my, hmm. I don't remember where I, <laughs> remember where I saved this paper to that I should probably move it to the um, oh right 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 I know where it is it's actually on a different computer but that's not a problem I will simply download download it from archive and open it up in here downloads um, do I trust the author yes I do because the author is me yes um, oh, that does not work. Let's see. All right, let me install this then. I'll just pause this real quick. All right, there we go. I had to uh, install. I didn't realize that you had to install. I've had VS Code for so long that when I re you know, reinstalled it cleanly that I forgot that you had to do this. Um, but here we go. Here's the nice little paper. Um, you can see it's short, it's quick. It does assume a decent amount of background knowledge. That's why I did make it so short is kind of assume you get the gist of RL and QML, right? There's, there's this, the shortest section I've ever written on quantum machine learning here. Um, so it's not, it's, 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 it does assume, right, that you know this. And so if you, if you've watched everything I've produced and you'll, you'll be fine to understand this. Um, but these are the results, right? So this is with the noiseless simulation without even shot noise. So this is with adjoint differentiation. You can see this is just the pure RL agents over here. This is gradient descent using atom optimizer. And this is the augmented um, per, you know, paper idea that I present here. Um, notice that these numbers are kind of meaningless, like going down a row is meaningless going the only thing that's meaningful is going or sorry going down a column is meaningless going across a row is meaningful and the numbers between right you could say oh 0.58 in the circle train here and 0.56 here that that's also meaningless because these problems are randomly generated um, so it, there's no meaning across tables but only across rows so we can see you know about what a third of the time the augmented performs best, the bold is clearly um, the best performing, which is the smallest number in every case, because this is the cost or the loss or whatever. Um, we can see with shot noise, right, the table gets smaller because running these 20 qubit simulations are not really feasible. Um, when you have to do long optimization procedures, that, that's, you know, that already these noisy simulations could take like 30 hours or something. So, you know, it's, it's very, very expensive to simulate. But we can see that in the case of shot noise and shot and depolarizing noise, that in general, the augmented um, RL optimizer does perform the best. Um, you can see the, the actual algorithm here, right? We just greedily take the best set of parameters from the, from the outputs, and uh, that's, all we, that's all we need to do. Uh, and so in terms of future work, right, it, this would be a great line. I mean, I, I can't you know, guarantee anything, but it seems like there's lots of interesting opportunities if you want to apply this work to hardware or to expand to larger qubit systems. That might be hard for any individual to do that isn't, you know, a Google employee or something. Um, but if you want to, like, verify this or experiment with noisy... Uh, hardware or something like that you could, uh, you could always build on it on another unitary fund uh, application which I'll, I'll, I'll 
put the info for the unitary fund below. And I've already said it before, but I'll say it again that I you know a big shout out and thank you to that organization for providing the funds to run all these systems, right? It's 150 hours on GPUs that I don't have, and that's just to train the examples I have here, all the testing, all the evaluating PPO, TD3 took many, many more hours. So, you know, there's a lot of work and cost that went into this. So it wouldn't have been possible without that organization and that fund. So, uh, you know, a huge thank you and, and shout out to them. And I encourage everyone to apply if you have any interesting ideas or software you're working on. Um, and so that's sort of, yeah, that's sort of the gist of it. Um, this sort of just went over the, the, the code a little more. All of the code's online. I'll, always, I'll link it as I did before, as I always do. And uh, I encourage you to look at the code more, you know, play around with it in your own circuits, and also um, read the paper. It's a, it's a short it's a short read. Um, so yeah, that's all for today.